notably in Oxford, I don't mention the other place, and um, it's in Oxford that we've got to know each other, so it's a particular pleasure to have him speak for us. Gary Rensberg is a, a, an extremely uh, distinguished scholar and a very versatile and prolific one, so um, it really is a privilege to host him. Um, he is the um, distinguished professor in the Department of Jewish Studies at Rutgers University in New Jersey and um, Blanche and Irving Laurie Professor of Jewish History. So um, he is a, 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 a wide-ranging historian, but um, of his um, seven books, quite a number are in the um, technical and indispensable field of Hebrew language studies and sociolinguistic questions like diglossia. And as you'll have seen from the um, little uh, uh, profile that we sent out, his secondary interests in themselves form a dazzling array, ancient Egypt, Dead Sea Scrolls, Hebrew manuscript tradition, and going on to Jewish life in the Middle Ages. Uh, he could have lectured to us on any of those to our profit and pleasure. Today, however, um, he's going to talk about a period that's sort of on the cusp between antiquity and the early Middle Ages. Um, it is um, uh, the development of the Jewish uh, of Jewish life in Arabia. Uh, it's a topic that um, is now actually rather a hot subject, although as um, your synopsis tells you, it, this has been perhaps the least known Jewish community in the ancient world or the least noticed. But with new finds deep in the Arabian Peninsula and a lot of uh, well, relatively, a lot of attention from scholars coming from slightly different directions. Suddenly, this whole tremendously important part of the Jewish diaspora is stringing in, springing into life. Um, uh, it's a multilingual world, so Gary is particularly um, well placed to interpret it. Without more ado, let me invite him to speak to us on the Jews in Arabia. Thank you, Tessa, very much for that very generous introduction. Okay, let's, here we go. Okay, and thank you again to all and to the AIAS for hosting. I've enjoyed my times in the UK, uh, both in Oxford and occasionally in the other place, and it was always a great pleasure to come to London. And I recall fondly my uh, in-person speak, uh, speaking at the AIAS uh, about a decade ago. As Tessa said, the Jews in Arabia is clearly the least known Jewish community of antiquity, but as she also correctly said, uh, it is becoming more and more part of the world of uh, the reconstruction of Jewish history in antiquity. So let's, um, let's begin, let's see here. Um, okay. With the map, just to recall uh, the Roman Empire, uh, with Judea, in the uh, eastern end of the Roman Empire. And as you can see already in this map, uh, Arabia is actually quite close by. Uh, Tessa correctly uses the word diaspora, but it's the near diaspora when you compare it to Jewish communities throughout the Mediterranean in Italy proper, as far west as Iberia, for example, or along the North African coast and so on. Now, how did the Jews and when did the Jews get to um, Arabia? So the two great revolts, of the first and second century CE, the Great Revolt, which led to the destruction of Jerusalem and the loss of the temple in the year 70, and eventually the fall of Masada in 73, and the Bar Kokhba Revolt uh, two generations later, which was, if you can even say this, even more devastating for the uh, people of Judea in the sense that in the wake of the revolt, uh, the region around uh, Jerusalem was cleared um, of its Jewish population. Uh, where did Jews go? Well, they went throughout the Roman Empire, as we know. They went to Rome itself. They, in the, they stayed in the land of Israel. They moved northward, where in the Galilee, a new prosperous Jewish community arose, certainly in the latter half of the second and third centuries, and so on. But a good number of Jews uh, clearly fled 
the Roman Empire itself, and you could flee eastward to uh, Mesopotamia. This map shows it as part of the Roman Empire, but it was uh, only for a small bit of uh, antiquity part of the Roman Empire. Uh, typically, it was under Persian control. So if you wanted to flee the Romans, an easy way to do so would just to uh, travel uh, not such a far distance in a southeasterly direction into Arabia. Northwestern Arabia, as you can see, is quite close. So if we look at the Arabian Peninsula, where it's focused on the two regions we're going to be uh, talking about today, uh, one of them is the northwestern corner of uh, Arabia, and I have put the box here around the three oasis sites of Tema, Al-Hijr, and uh, Dedan, and we'll be looking at those uh, to start. And then in the far southwest corner of Arabia, modern-day Yemen, uh, we'll be moving uh, southward to that region and focusing especially on the kingdom of Khimyar, which you see written there in all caps. So let's begin in northwestern Arabia. I have to begin by saying that I've never been to this region. I have relied uh, on everything that I'm going to present today on the uh, work of other scholars, including our colleague, uh, Michael McDonald of Oxford, who I believe I saw on the participant list, and uh, several other colleagues whose photos uh, I will uh, show you as we proceed. This is a vast emptiness. I've been to Southern Jordan uh, and looked over the border into um, the present day kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So it all looks more or less like this. It's one big vast, emptiness. These are some uh, stock photos here from uh, the internet. Uh, so the oasis of Tema, uh, and you can see immediately the palm trees of so the map there on the bottom right gives you a sense of where it is. If you've been to southern Israel, you can see a lot. If you've been to southern Jordan, you get a sense of where the national boundary is. And the uh, Tema oasis uh, led to a, a spring with all the palm trees. You can see on the upper right there the water wheels. Uh, bring, which bring the water up, uh, of course, allowed for a community to uh, develop there. Uh, this is the earliest attestation of a Jewish community in uh, Tema. This was uh, co-published by uh, the self-same Michael McDonald, whom I uh, mentioned a few moments ago. And it is a, a tombstone. In fact, most of what we're going to look at today are tombstones. So this is written in the Nabataean script. This is Aramaic written in the Nabataean script. So those of you who've been to Petra, which is uh, a high point for anyone who travels in the Middle East in Southern Jordan, will know that this was the major city of the Nabataeans. There are Nabataean sites uh, throughout Southern Jordan, Petra being the most famous of them, uh, in the Southern Israel, in uh, Northern Arabia. Uh, they uh, used Aramaic in their, as their written language, although um, we believe that they spoke Arabic or an early form of what we would call Arabic today. So here it is, the memorial, that is the same memorial plaque, or the memorial of, uh, look at the personal names, Isaiah, Yosef, Amram, three biblical names, Ashmu is not, but when you see three out of the four biblical names, Hebrew names, clearly we're dealing here with a, a Jewish tombstone. And then you can date this. You date this to, uh, by counting up the numbers there at the end, it's the year 98. You add this to 105, which is how they mark their calendar, 105, from what we would call today 105 CE. And you have a Jewish tombstone from the year 203 CE uh, at the oasis of uh, Tema. More uh, remarkably, notice who our friend Isaiah is. He is the counselor, that is to say, a member of the city council, son of Yosef, chief citizen of Tema. So this is not a Jew who just arrived yesterday in the year 200 or 201 or 202, right? This is somebody who's actually already risen to the ranks of counselor and chief citizen, something like the mayor or serving on the city council of an important uh, oasis city in uh, Northern Arabia. Uh, this is where we quote the um, well-known um, Jewish American historian, uh, Jacob Rader Marcus, who used to say, who lived to be 100 by the way, taught at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati for many, many years. And he's a historian both of medieval Jewry and of American Jewry. And Professor Marcus would uh, fondly say, the first Jews in a place were met by the Jews already there. What a great quip, right? And that really 
uh, uh, signifies Jewish history, which is to say, this is the first att attestation of a Jew in Tema in 203. But as I said, he didn't arrive yesterday. He must have been there for a generation or two generations to allow, you know how immigrant populations work, to allow for this person, Isaiah, to make it to the rank of counselor and unclear whether his father Yosef is the chief citizen or whether Isaiah himself is the chief citizen. But you get the point I'm making here. If in 203 you have a person like this, uh, probably the Jewish community was already established a, a couple of generations earlier. We may be looking at the son or grandson of somebody who fled either the first revolt or perhaps the second revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt, uh, the fascination of reconstructing uh, Jewish history. If we move slightly south to the uh, second site of Al-Hijr, modern uh, Madain Salih in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, you see, if you've been to Jordan, if you've been to Petra, you see something that looks very similar, right? These uh, stone buildings carved right into the mountain sides. And here again, we have a good uh, Aramaic inscription in Nabataean uh, script. We can date this one to the year 356. And again, you'll notice that we have somebody named Adyon, the son of Honi, the son of Samuel, another person who was chief citizen, right? And a mention again, chief citizen of this place, uh, Hajra or Hajra, and uh, notice again mention of another individual who was the chief citizen of Tema, dying in the month of such and such uh, in the year 251. And again, you reconstruct that to be 356 CE. So we're centuries before the rise of Islam. We'll end our survey uh, uh, this afternoon for you, this morning still for me here on the east coast of the US by, uh, the, with the rise of Islam, but we're talking about the pre-Islamic period in, um, in Arabia. Uh, there's also this wonderful sundial which is now in the Istanbul Museum and here in, um, in Aramaic, I've transcribed it for you here on the right, uh, it says Menashe Bar Natan, Shlam, that is to say, Manasseh, the son of Nathan, and then uh, the word for uh, the word for peace. So uh, here is your uh, inscription transcribing this. For those of you who can read Hebrew slash Aramaic in the traditional Jewish script, you can read this, which means he donated the sundial to the uh, community. Right. We go slightly further south. We're now 22K or 14 miles south of Hedra. You see the map on the bottom right. You come to uh, this site uh, today called Ula. Uh, it's ancient Dedan, a, uh, another one of these great oasis sites in Northwestern Arabia. You have this great emptiness. You look at the landscape here, this great emptiness. And then you have an oasis with greenery and obviously that sustains um, uh, human life. So this is the old town, uh, now abandoned as far as I know. You can still see the traditional architecture here. Obviously things have developed, so we now have a more modern city that you're seeing here. But here's the old town of Ula. And uh, again, similar to what we saw in the previous images at Madain Salih, you have these mountainsides carved into the mountainsides are these tombs. And uh, um, with all sorts of inscriptions, these are Arabic inscriptions of more recent vintage. Uh, sometimes we get some of these older inscriptions in a variety of scripts, okay? Something, uh, this is a, uh, like the South Arabian script right here, but it, the script was spread throughout uh, the Arabian Peninsula. We'll see more of this later on. And of course, it's always wonderful to see things like ostriches uh, being portrayed and uh, a desert fox over here. Uh, being portrayed, uh, carved into these uh, uh, side of uh, stone sides of these mountains uh, centuries ago. Now, back in the early 20th century, these two remarkable men, Dominican priests uh, from Jerusalem, French Dominicans, uh, Sauvignac and Josan, and there they are, photo from 1920. In the decades before that, they did expeditions, repeated expeditions into um, Arabia, especially Northwestern Arabia. They were on the faculty at the Ecole Biblique in Jerusalem. Those of you who know Jerusalem, it's in uh, East Jerusalem. It's a Dominican monastery, but it is also a school uh, where you can do advanced studies in biblical studies and archaeology and uh, has the best library uh, in, not only in Jerusalem, but perhaps in the entire world for uh, biblical studies. And so Sauvignon 
and Josan went off into the desert. Oh, here's a nice picture of Josan with T.E. Lawrence. Anytime you speak to a British audience and can show yet another photo of Lawrence of Arabia, it's always worth doing. So there, there's the two gentlemen on the right. Uh, they went off into Arabia and published and did these explorations and published a series of volumes you see here, 1909 and 1914, and exploring the same three places that I have just shown you, which is to say, Tema, uh, Hydra, and Al-Allah, well, Al along with a few other places you see on the title page here. And they published all of their documentation. They would copy down the inscriptions that they saw. They would describe just about anything that they saw. And in one image, they put together here all of the so-called Hebrew inscriptions, which they found in that uh, vast emptiness with the few OAC sites that I have just shown you. So this is from volume two of their 1914 volume. And they put all of the inscriptions uh, here together. So this is the Hebrew slash Aramaic script. Uh, these scripts are quite fluid. It's not quite clear that all of these are uh, Jewish. But let's just look at a few of them. So the one on the upper right, which they labeled number one, is Naim ben Ishaq. Okay, so this would be a person's name. Those of you can read the Hebrew letters there, Naim ben Ishaq. So that would be Isaac, but they're spelling it in the more Arabic fashion, Ishaq, as opposed to Yitzhak. Over here, you have Barech Elohim, bless God. Right? And here you have, um, uh, Ismail ben Sadok vikatab, and I'm reading in the Civil War Hebrew, and wrote uh, Ismail, that is to say Ishmael of Hebrew or uh, Ishmael in English, but written again in Arabic style here, uh, Aleph Samech, not in what you would expect in Hebrew. Uh, you would also have an Aleph at the end in the Hebrew, so Ismail. Uh, ben Sadok. These are almost undoubtedly uh, Jews, right, when you see names uh, coming out of the Bible uh, such as this. Now, the rest of inscription number one, which is all of this here, um, uh, they were unable to quite understand what it meant. The last word is again katab, so that means he wrote. Uh, this is the publication, page 641. You get a sense of how massive these volumes are, right? This is page 641, and you can see chapter five, uh, some text in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, right? So, and they start out with the Hebrew inscription. So here is our friend Naim ben Ishaq, the Naim, the son of Isaac. And then they couldn't make out the first two words and they just, they just put all the dots there. Uh, scholarship builds because one scholar um, uh, builds on the work of a previous scholar. So here I want to bring into the picture Simon Hopkins, uh, our colleague at the Hebrew University. Londoners may know uh, Professor Hopkins did his PhD at SOAS, um, and he recently published an article, Judeo-Arabic Inscriptions from Northern Arabia. And looking at the rest of this inscription, number one, this is again clearly Katav, he wrote. Um, Simon Hopkins interpreted this, uh, as I indicate here, transcribing it, as the um, alayafiku, uh, in God he trusts. So if you read Hebrew, you see that this looks more like a Dalid. But uh, ha uh, Simon Hopkins believes that we should read this as a hay, either the little part of the hay, this little part right here, uh, is probably no longer visible on the rock. And therefore, uh, over a century ago, our French colleagues didn't read it as a hay, but rather as a Dalid. And so if we make this out to be the word for God, in God he trusts. Uh, um, there's the tha, sim, the tha sound of Arabic cannot be represented in the Hebrew script, so they just use the taf. When we translate, transliterate it, we put the uh, dot over uh, the taf. So this is the work of Simon Hopkins. So that is to say, Naim ben Ishaq, our friend, in Allah he trusts, and then he wrote, Katab, he wrote uh, this. Uh, as for this person over here, um, is the, um, uh, it was, the second word there is clearly Samuel, Shmuel, but the question is, what was the first word? It looks like it might be, if you were reading this in Aramaic or in Hebrew, something like unto eternity, but uh, Simon Hopkins has suggested, and I think he's correct, that we read this as um, the, an Arabic phrase written in Hebrew letters, right? Uh, alim, something like the scholar, 
Uh, and so this is the scholar Samuel. And that's why Hopkins has called this, the title of this article, Judeo-Arabic inscriptions, right? These are not quite Hebrew, but these are Arabic expressions like this one here. Uh, you can't tell just by looking at a person's name, but by reading this as he's done and by reading this as the Arabic word for the scholar, he suggested that these are the earliest Judeo-Arabic writings we have. In the Middle Ages, as many of you know, Judeo-Arabic will become a very important language attested by uh, thousands of documents, especially from the Cairo Geniza, uh, and uh, all sorts of other great writings of Sa'ad Gaon and Maimonides and Judah Halevi, all the medieval luminaries um, in, uh, in the Jewish community were writing in Arabic, but in Hebrew letters. Here you have, hard to date these, but let's say third, fourth, fifth uh, century CE, um, something like early Arabic, I guess is what we would call this, written in Hebrew letters, hence Judeo-Arabic inscriptions. So we go back to the desert, uh, and here is a, a map of the places that we've been, some of the places we've been looking at. Here you see the uh, last two places uh, that we've just looked at, and we're back on the road. And here, um, again, in this emptiness, uh, one finds rock inscriptions of the type you see here in Northwestern Arabia. And I now want to uh, give credit to our colleague, Ahmed Al-Jalad of Ohio State University, uh, who has assiduously gone out into these uh, desert regions on these expeditions um, and uh, recently uh, published this, or recently uh, um, discussed this, pub this uh, newly published text right here. We don't even know what to call it. It's Jewish, as I'll show you in a moment, but it's Nabataean Aramaic slash Arabic. Um, and this is the transcription of the letters into the Hebrew slash Aramaic Jewish script that many of us are much with, with which many of us are much more familiar. And the English translation is um, something like yay, may Sholai the son of Ausho, nothing Jewish about either of those names per se, be remembered uh, in goodness, betav vishalam, in goodness and in peace, min um, kadam alma, before the Lord of the world. And he wrote this, or this writing rather, he wrote Yom Hag al Patir, on the day of the feast of the unleavened bread, of the matzot. So this is patir, the Aramaic word for matzah, and it's got the Arabic definite article in front of it. There's no hyphen in the actual text. I put it in there. So we have something like al-patir, the day, yom hag al-patir, the day of the festival of matzot. And then the date again is given to us, which allows us to date this to 302 uh, CE. Some Jew out in the middle of nowhere almost um, has this little inscription here written on uh, Passover. And that's the region that we've been talking about, again, not too far in northwestern Arabia from the land of Israel and from Jerusalem uh, specifically. Now, in Tema, we have reference to, uh, from Tema, we have reference to a Jewish uh, scholar from later on. Uh, I'll explain the uh, evidence for him. Uh, the uh, later um, Muslim writers uh, referred, the great Muslim poets of the early Islamic period, writing in Arabic, uh, knew of a Jewish poet and warrior of Tema who built a castle, and the castle was described by a later Arabic writer, uh, and his name was uh, Shmuel ben Adia. Uh, they date him to the first half of the 6th century CE, uh, so that's his name more or less, Hebraized, but you can see at the very top I put uh, Samuel or Samuel uh, ben Adia. And uh, one document of his turned up in the Cairo Geniza collection, uh, in the Cairo Geniza, now in the Cambridge collection. Uh, it just says that it's a Qasida poem, that's a type of Arabic poetry, written by Samuel. It says it up here uh, at the top. Um, we don't know that it's exactly our Samuel because it only says Samuel, but if you see a poem written in early Arabic, a Qasida, and we know that Samuel ibn Adiya wrote such poetry, um, this was the conclusion, certainly, of the original publication of this by Hartwig Hirschfeld in the Jewish Quarterly Review in those years, what we call the old series published in London. Um, the new series has been published in Philadelphia for uh, almost the last, um, uh, for about 80, 90 years now. 
but this is a poem attributed to Al Samuel, according to Hirschfeld. He was challenged by some other scholars, but he believes that the document that we see here found in the Cairo Geniza, which is to say his poetry was still being uh, copied centuries later, is our famous uh, Jewish poet from Tema uh, of the sixth century. So fascinating material uh, coming to us from all quarters. Let's move to the southwestern corner of modern day Yemen. Let's uh, keep in mind that Yemen today is so forlorn and such a difficult situation there. Uh, so whenever I speak about the uh, uh, ancient Yemeni or ancient uh, uh, communities of this part of South Arabia, uh, we always have to keep in mind what's happening today. And we're going to talk specifically about uh, the Jewish kingdom of Himyar, uh, which you see uh, here, some of these cities you know, Aden, um, Sana'a, the modern day capital of Yemen. But in antiquity, the kingdom of Himyar's capital was Safar right here. And this was a Jewish kingdom. Uh, the most famous king was Yusuf Dunuwas, who reigned in the first uh, part of the sixth century CE. And this was a kingdom, this was a, a, these were people in Yemen who converted to Judaism uh, and established a Jewish kingdom. Now the purpose of this conversion is still unclear. We can point out that right across the Red Sea, is the kingdom of Aksum, an early Christian kingdom in what is today modern day Eritrea and a little bit of Ethiopia. Uh, and this was the a Christian kingdom that was established here. It's part of the early Ethiopian Orthodox church um, spreading uh, into that part of the Horn of Africa. And perhaps because their rival kingdom across the Red Sea had become Christian, the people of Yemen seeking out a monotheistic religion as well, converted to Judaism. And again, the most famous of these kings is Yusuf, who I have indicated for you here with his dates. Now, what does um, the economy of this region based on? Um, the two leading products and exports from Southern Arabia in ancient times were the, uh, the sweet woods of myrrh and frankincense. And this is the only place in the world where they grow. And the people of Southern Arabia exported these um, two um, plants uh, throughout the Near East. They fed the temples of ancient Israel, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the great temples of Egypt into the Mediterranean, to the classical world of the Greeks and the Romans. Because these temples where animal sacrifices occurred required these sweet, sweet smelling woods and you had little incense altars. Those of you who know the biblical tradition know that first in the tabernacle and later in the temple, there's also an incense altar. What was being burned on these incense altars throughout these great temples of the ancient world, the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean, these are the myrrh and frankincense plants. And so these people in Southern Arabia became exceedingly wealthy by having a monopoly as it were, and they would ship them north either on ships on the Red Sea, and then from Aqaba slash Eilat, they would be transported over land to the port of Gaza and into the Mediterranean, or by camel caravan up the eastern coast, sorry, western coast of the Arabian uh, Peninsula. These are the general excavations of uh, at Safar in Yemen. Rock cut chambers, these are not Jewish, but they're just general excavation uh, images, which I'm showing you. And then here we begin to find some Jewish inscriptions. Now the language of this region is called South Arabian, which is a series of closely related languages. The best attested of them is the Sabaic language, which is what I will be showing you uh, mainly. That's the, uh, the language that was in this corner of uh, South Arabia, and it's Sabaic. And I've put boxes around. Uh, this is a very large inscription, as you can see here. And I will transcribe the letters of the uh, old South Arabian alphabet into, again, the alphabet that many of us know how to read. So in the upper right, it says Yehuda. And then you actually have in the large box, the people of Israel. And at the bottom there, the word for uh, synagogue, okay, Mikrab. So this is uh, clear evidence of a Jewish community in Safar by around the year 400 CE. And this was my opening, oh, and it also refers to, it, it, it's uh, over here it reads, and then it continues over here. It reads the Lord of uh, life and death, Lord of heaven and earth. So this is old South Arabian, but if you know sufficient amount of Hebrew and Aramaic, you can see that all the Semitic languages are very clearly related to one another. So you have Mara, Hain, 
right? Umotan, the Lord of uh, Mutan, the Lord of uh, life and death, uh, Lord of heaven and earth, something like Mara Shamayan Vardan, something like that. I'm sort of a mix here of pronouncing this as it were, as if it were both, you know, Aramaic slash Arabic, but it's all in South Arabian. Uh, but this is clearly the sort of a monotheistic um, declaration, right? The God who the people of, um, the, of Israel worship is uh, the Lord of life and death, the Lord of heaven and earth. In the middle of that, let's go back right here, and this was my opening image, right? These are monograms or monographs where you have large letters uh, spelling out uh, individual words in these South Arabian inscriptions. But in the middle, somebody wrote a piece of Hebrew graffito. You all remember your Italian, right? Graffiti is plural, okay, graffito. A Hebrew graffito at the center of the inscription. And it says, and if you can read Hebrew, I've transcribed it here for you, but if you can read Hebrew, you can read this. Katav Yehuda Zachor Latov, Amen, Shalom, Amen. Judah wrote this, may he be remembered for good, Amen, Shalom, Amen. So somebody in South Arabia, uh, circa 400 CE has enough knowledge of Hebrew in addition to the native South Arabian language to write this little piece of Hebrew in the middle of this very large South Arabian inscription. Another inscription mentioning the people of Israel, or actually it says their people of Israel. Again, God is referred to as El or God, Lord of heaven and earth. Another inscription referring to the Lord of heaven, the God of Israel. These are all from Southern Arabia. A synagogue dedication inscription dated to the year 433 from a place 70 kilometers north of Sana'a. Really remarkable material. And here's the translation of this uh, uh, synagogue dedication inscription. You see our word mikrab for synagogue. Uh, all sorts of um, recognizable Jewish concepts, God, Lord of the sky and the earth, and so on. At the bottom, Shalom, Shalom, written in the old South Arabian script. We also have a cemetery dedication inscription. I don't have a photo of this available, but from South Arabia, from Yemen, modern day Yemen, the names of the people of this community, and it tells you where this entire uh, plot of land has been granted to the Jews to bury their, their deceased there with the guarantee that the burial of the Gentile next to them will be avoided because that would con be contrary to Jewish law, right? So that they will fulfill their obligations towards the Jews and it gives you the plots. It's like a survey here, which gives you the dimensions and the distances and where this, these plots of land, here's a continuation uh, of this inscription. One shall avoid burying a Gentile on these plots. As we'll see, that's not always the case. Uh, but um, that's the standard approach to Jewish law would be to have Jews buried separately in their own cemeteries. So I hope you're all being fascinated by this remarkable wealth of material, first in Northern Arabia, now in Southern Arabia. And here is the general excavations. Again, I don't have a photo of the inscription, but just some of the um, excavations of this region. An Aramaic seal was found in Safar, go back to, going back to the capital city. So if you think about the way seals work, right, you would stamp the seal onto the document, which means that the actual seal has to be inverted. We don't really stamp things anymore. We sometimes go to the notary who stamps something for us, or maybe at the post office you get something stamped. And so that stamp is, in the old days, library stamps. Uh, those stamps are always written with reverse letters. So this is what you're seeing here. This is the seal. This is the reverse. Uh, this is what it actually looks like. But thank you, Photoshop, because you can now play with these things and actually uh, have them look uh, like the way the, the actual writing would appear once it was stamped. And this um, says here, Yitzchak. These are recognizable letters if you can read Hebrew. Yitzchak bar Hanina. Okay. So this is... Uh, the seal of uh, somebody named Isaac, the son of Hanina. A bilingual Aramaic slash Hebrew Sabaic tomb inscription. It's the tomb of Leah. Again, can you read, he if you can read this with me, it starts out in Aramaic and then it segues to Hebrew. Hada kivurata 
the Leah brat Yehuda. This is the tomb of Leah, the daughter of Judah. And then it shifts over into Hebrew, Nishmatah l'chaye olam, may her, um, uh, may her soul be for eternal life. V'tanuach v'ta'amod le'goral ha'im le'ketz ha'yamin, amen v'yamin, shalom. And may she rest, and may she rise up at the goral, at the sort of the, at the, at the predetermined time, uh, the, the, or the, the fate of life, literally, the goral ha'im, uh, at, the, at the determined time of life, uh, you mean at the end of days, amen, amen, shalom, and then more or less the same thing being said there in the Sabaic script. So just remarkable that we have these inscriptions from the region. A church historian, uh, Philostorgius, um, who bridges the fourth and fifth century, wrote the, an ecclesiastical history, a story of the church, um, one, of the, one of the church fathers, and in his writings, he reports that there was a Christian missionary, Theophilus, who went down to Yemen in the middle of the fourth century, so a generation or two before um, Philosorgius wrote, and that Theophilus reports that he found many Jews living in Yemen in the fourth century. Um, that's about as much as we knew until the discoveries of the archaeological work that I'm sharing with you uh, today. Another tombstone, a man named Isaac, and now I want to give credit to the person who has really uncovered most of the material that I'm sharing with you today, and that's Christian Rovan, our colleague uh, in Paris. He is the world's expert on the history of uh, South Arabia, uh, and all of the thousands, literally there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of inscriptions found, and Rovan, and he's reconstructed the whole history of the region, the various kingdoms and so on, and the economy. Roban, I want to make this clear, did not go to Yemen in search of Jews, right? Neither did, go back to Northwestern Arabia, neither did Michael McDonald or Ahmed al-Jalad go searching for Jews in the vast emptiness. But all you do is explore the North Arabian inscriptions, or in this case, the South Arabian inscriptions, and you all of a sudden realize there is a Jewish presence in the Arabian Peninsula uh, in these um, centuries, third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries. Uh, and Robin published two very long articles, you can see how long these articles are, uh, on the Judaism and the Jewish presence in uh, the kingdom of Khinyar. A Hebrew inscription was found there, nothing South Arabian here at all other than its location, 15 kilometers east of Sana. This Hebrew inscription was found. And what is it? It is a list of the 24 Mishmarot. Now those of you who know the biblical tradition or the, uh, the Second Temple period tradition will know that in the temple there were rotations of priests, which we call Mishmarot. There were 24 families which rotated uh, in the service of uh, attending to the temple service. And First Chronicles 24, one of the latest books of the Bible to be written, gives us the names of these uh, Mishmarot, these priestly families. Nine of them that appear in the book of Chronicles appear here in this inscription. It just shows you the continuity of this Jewish tradition from the land of Israel, fourth, third, second, first centuries, BCE to Southern Arabia. This is hard to date, but let's say third or fourth, or maybe fifth century CE. And of course the temple's been destroyed for several hundred years by the time this text in front of you is written. And yet these families, these priestly families or these Jews of Arabia kept track of the Jewish priestly families who had been in their day in charge of the temple service. I want to bring us back to the land of Israel to conclude, although we'll then have a coda after the conclusion. This is Tsoar in southern Jordan. Again, a vast emptiness. Here it is on the map at the southern end of the Dead Sea, but on the Jordanian side of the current Israeli-Jordanian border vast emptiness. And in that emptiness, a burial site was found, uh, a cemetery was found with thousands of Jewish and Christian burials in the ground that you see here in this aerial photograph, dating to about third through the sixth century CE. This is an instance where Christians and Jews were buried in the same cemetery. Now most of these are Christian, and we have Christian iconography, crosses, and so on, but a good number of these are Jewish as well. Here's a close-up of some of these. 
So I've never met the gentleman, but those of you in London may know Konstantinos Politis of the British Museum, obviously Greek originally, um, now the British Museum, who is the chief archeologist here, who has uncovered so many of these um, burial sites. And here we are. And here are some of those Jewish tombstones that I referred to. So you see the writing is now Aramaic slash Hebrew. You see Jewish iconography, especially uh, the menorah, which is the most prominent Jewish symbol, as most of you know, uh, from this time period. You see on the uh, bottom right here, you see a shofar. Uh, the week before Rosh Hashanah, here is a shofar for us. This presumably is a lulav carved into this rock. Uh, a tombstone in Greek, but the person is indicated to be the archisynagogos, the head of the synagogue. All that is background, right? So there's Jews in Soar in southern Jordan, and all of that is background for this. One of the tomb inscriptions found there, written in Aramaic, reads as follows. The photograph is legible, but it's even easier if we look at the line drawing. And this person's name is Yosef, son of Alpha. And it says that he comes from the town of Tzafar. If you can read it here, Tet Pe Resh. There is this Arabic sound, oh, has no equivalent in the Hebrew alphabet, so you write it with a Tet, right? From the land of Chimyar, which you can see right here. And he moved to the land of Israel. Now, you may say, well, Tzohar is not the land of Israel, but it is the land of Israel, greater Eretz Yisrael, okay? He moved there because he, at the end of his life, he wanted to be buried there. And this is dated to the 400th year, we think. It's not clear. Shnat, and then it's not clear. There may be a taf here to say the year 400. Um, Le Chorban Beit Mikdasha, the 400th year of the destruction, if that is in fact a taf, barely visible, uh, indicating the number four, the numeral 400. Um, this is according to one interpretation by Yosef Nave, uh, now deceased of the Hebrew University. Um, this has been uh, published again by, um, 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 <laughs> I'm drawing a blank, our colleague at UCL. Uh, who works on calendars, uh, <laughs> you will remind me in just a moment. Um, Sasha uh, Stern. Sasha Stern, <laughs> thank you, Sintessa, uh, has just recently republished this in a wonderful article. Uh, he doubts that it actually says uh, top for 400, but you can see there, um, again, some of the words at the end, uh, Shalom uh, and Shalom, you know, may there be peace upon his grave or his resting place, Shalom. And a menorah, right, see the outline of the menorah. So this man was transported from his home in Southern Arabia to the land of Israel to be buried. But they went even further north because there is a cave, a catacomb at Beit Sha'arim dedicated to the people of Chimyar. Many of us have been to Beit Sha'arim, iconic picture of the main entrance way into the main catacomb. And here we are inside the uh, catacombs with these various sarcophagi. And this is a section in one of the other catacombs. There are dozens of catacombs there every year. The Israel Antiquities Authority is opening up several more of these. And this is um, uh, the one dedicated to the Chimya rites. How do we know that? It's very hard to read. But up here on the archway, in Greek, it says of the Chimya rites. Let me change the lighting for you. And so this is um, the Greek writing there, which says that this belongs to the Chimya rites. Um, and uh, therefore, we know that they also transported their deceased 2,600 kilometers from Chimyar, modern-day Yemen, to Beit Sha'arim in the Lower Galilee to be buried. A remarkable story of the Jews of the Arabian Peninsula. The coda to this is the central part of the Arabian Peninsula, where you have the two cities of Mecca and Medina, which I did not mention yet, but which, of course, are uh, so prominent in the rise of Islam and the life of Muhammad. The later Arabic, um, uh, the later uh, Muslim writer, uh, Abu al-Faraj al-Isfahani, writing in the 10th century, 
tells us that the Jews arrived in Hejaz, that's this region of central Western Arabia. The Jews arrived in Hejaz in the wake of the Roman Jewish wars. That's where we started, right? First and second century uh, CE, the two great revolts. And uh, we have no reason to doubt the, uh, what he has stated here. Uh, in the Quran, you have references to Jewish tribes. There's a wonderful Quran manuscript for you, very early old one, notice the dating, seventh century. Uh, the very time of the uh, beginnings of Islam. So we know that there were Jewish tribes in or near Medina uh, in the seventh century. They're all mentioned in the Quran. And two of those tribes are actually referred to, I put the P next to it, as priestly tribes, Al-Kahinan, okay, the priestly tribes. So this gives you a sense of which kind of Jews and so on were living out in the Arabian Peninsula in this very region that I've indicated here for us on the map. What a great excursion. Thank you for the opportunity to present all of this to you today. Toda, shukran. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, and um, is it okay if we move straight on to questions? Absolutely. Um, and I already have one from, uh, Graham Morris, um, but I need now, if I'm to have him ask it, which I always think is rather nice because we get a real conversation. I, 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 I unmuted to... myself. You, you can unmute yourself. Perfect. Good. Yes, I thought I I'd managed... do it. Yes. Carry on, Graham. If before I ask this question, I could just mention that our very good friend, Sasha Stern, I don't know whether he mentions this in his article, but he had an opportunity of examining, I think, two or more of the uh, tombstones in the collection of the late Shlomo Musayef, Allah HaShalom, who had a remarkable uh, collection, I don't know what's happened to it now, of antiquities going back a very long way. And Sasha uh, told us of his visit to Shlomo, who we knew also very well, my wife and I know, knew very well, and how he had the, because it has a very important significance for Sasha in his calendrical studies and his uh, whole, the whole uh, subject of, uh, of Jewish calendar, but that he was very, he, he felt very privileged to be able to examine these, I think there were two uh, tombstones in the collection of Shlomo Mosayev. But the question I wanted to ask, and it may be a little bit political, but perhaps rather significant at the present time, has there been any acknowledgement of these Jewish inscriptions in any university or even in the museum or any tourist uh, brochures or anything in Saudi Arabia? I dare to ask Yemen whether Yemen is in turmoil or maybe was always uh, somewhat backward, but uh, has there been any acknowledgement in Saudi Arabia? Right, so I can't speak to Yemen, and you're absolutely correct about the turmoil and essentially the lack of any governmental structure there. The times, um, in American English, we say the times, they are a changing. Um, so the answer to that question is yes, Saudi Arabia is very interested in opening up to tourism, uh, including at Madain Salih. Uh, they are not hiding the Jewish past. I will tell you that two years ago, Christian Robin uh, came from Paris to give a seminar at Princeton, which is just um, 20 miles from where I from where I live. Our two universities are very close to one another, Rutgers and Princeton. And I attended the week-long seminar uh, that Robin gave. He did. He spent an entire day. One of the five days was speaking about the Jews and Christians. Of um, uh, I spoke only on the Jewish material here, but he spoke on the Jewish and Christian inscriptions. And one morning on the Jews, and one morning on the afternoon on the, on the Christians. Uh, scholars came from all over the world, including from Saudi Arabia, to be part of that um, uh, to be part of that seminar, uh, and they were all equally fascinated by this. Uh, they were either Saudis who came from Saudi Arabia for the seminar, or they were already studying in the U.S. And uh, it, it was just remarkable to see these scholars from all over the world. So we all have the hope. Uh, we're all optimistic, and of course, there's been major advancements even in the this week and in the prior month with Israel establishing relations with two of the Gulf states, yeah. uh, that this will all open up. And so I look forward myself, I mean, as a U.S. citizen or as a U.K. citizen, you can go to these places. There's no problem doing so. Now we can't travel anywhere. 
But um, inshallah, yes, we will all go visit these places. They're truly um, remarkable sites. And I look forward to my own travels there. And may, it, may there be peace in, in Yemen in particular, where um, so much of this is, is to be seen. As for Sasha Stern, and I apologize. Thank you, Tess. I don't know. I just drew a blank. I'm picturing him and everything. Um, uh, um, seeing these inscriptions, I never knew a Musayef, whose collection was in uh, London. I believe that the one that I showed you, where it says the 400th year of the destruction of the temple, we don't know if it says 400 actually, but it's something dated to the destruction of the temple. I believe that that one is in the collection of David Sofer, who's also in London. Indeed. I think Sasha another, reports. Another good friend. <laughs> okay, I believe Sasha reports that he that he was he saw it in the collection of David Sofer. Sasha knows David Sofer very well. <laughs> okay, so it's all London based. Indeed. Great, thank you. Can I invite more questions um, to the chat? Meanwhile, might I just ask you, uh, Gary? Uh, you've mentioned the Christian. Uh, presence on and off, uh, and you've mentioned the Christian uh, kingdom in Aksum, and we've seen one mixed cemetery uh, up in, in, in Jordan, but could you say a few words about whether there are ever any, I mean, are, are there Christians down in Yemen, and are there any problems of distinguishing in some cases Christian from Jewish inscriptions where you've just got names? Uh. Um, and of course, a wonderful question, Tessa, and it's not only a problem in Arabia, as you know better than I, it's a problem wherever you go in the Mediterranean, to what extent could any of these, uh, obviously Christians could have been using biblical names as well. When it says the people of Israel, almost undoubtedly we're talking about a Jewish community, but if you have just bare names and they are biblical names, in theory they could be Christian, I don't know enough about the onomasticon. I believe that um, uh, Christians used biblical names less frequently than Jews did. I think Jews were much more uh, still using biblical names, especially um, uh, during this time period. So I think the default is to just assume if you just see X son of Y, uh, or even you know we saw um, you know X daughter or X daughter of Y. Uh, we, we really don't know, of course, but the, the working hypothesis is that they are Jewish. I should mention, I didn't include this in my talk, but as long as you mention this, Tessa, and I don't have the material uh, at my, my ready disposal, but there were these Jewish Christian sects that continued into the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. They are known as the Ebionites and the Nazarenes. And the Ebionites, for those of you who know Hebrew, is Evyonim, the, the humble people. And in fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls sect refer to themselves frequently. The Qumran community refers to them frequently as the Evyonim. Um, and uh, they are to be still seen in the Arabian Peninsula into the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries. We have evidence from Muslim writers of the, uh, these Jewish Christian sects. Uh, I've never really studied them that closely, but that would be part of, the, part of the larger picture to which you were referring. That is to say, Jews, identifying as Jews, but recognizing Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, uh, and therefore they are Jewish Christian sects that continue into the Middle Ages. We know about them from other places as well, but we have reports of them in, in Arabia, I think as late as the 10th century. Yes, well, well thank you. Um, so uh, uh, intriguing indeed. And now, uh, Rachel, can you, I can't unmute you. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, no problem. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. can yeah, yep, fine. Yeah, I had a question. I mean, one of the things I found slightly uncomfortable about your presentation, although I enjoyed it very much, was the material you're discussing, for example, from Zohar, from Safi and Jordan, where you've got these fabulous um, Jewish and Christian tombstones, but where all the material that we're talking about was illicitly excavated and looted. And this was one of the big tragedies of the late 90s and early 2000s, that this fabulous cemetery was sort of lost to archaeology because the material was being ripped out of the ground illegally and has now gone into a lot of private collections. And I just wondered, you know, whether we could make this a bit more prominent part of the discussion, the loss of archaeological context and the loss of information as a result of that. 
right. because I mean it's interesting with um, Dino's work with material he faced this big dilemma do I you know try and stop the problem which everybody was trying to do and couldn't or do I try and salvage what has been lost by recording the tombstones and I know you know he was always in a, in a very um, difficult situation with how he, he figured out a way of dealing with this material but I just wonder what your perspective on, on the problems are because I mean, also just to point out that lovely shot you showed of the cemetery, all those poles were looted tombs. You know, right. They weren't legally accepted. Right. So thank you for raising the issue. And um, I, I, I'm of two minds like everybody else is. Right. Um, it was certainly wrong in, in years past to just, you know, loot and loot and loot. And of course, it still continues today. Um, cuneiform tablets in particular are, you know, picked off the surface or just beneath the surface in Iraq and put onto the antiquities market. Um, so I, I, I'm, I look, uh, uh, what does one say? Um, in, a, in, a, in a perfect world, everything would be perfectly excavated, scientifically excavated by archaeologists and so on. On the other hand, if we didn't have, and I'm not, I'm not promoting looting, of course, but if we didn't have these documents, however they came into our hands, we wouldn't be able to reconstruct so much of what we're able to reconstruct. So um, the, the solution, of course, is for the world to just get together and say, here's the billions of dollars or even hundreds of millions of dollars and pounds which are necessary for the uh, excavations of all these areas. And uh, train the next generation. They are certainly doing that. By the way, I mentioned the first question was about the Saudis. The Saudis are um, are very much aware of the fact they are sitting on archaeological um, wonders, and they are training archaeologists uh, and are working, you know, for Egypt, um, uh, which it's not. It's no longer, you know, the the, the British, French, German, American, etc. Colonials who are coming, imperial powers who are coming in to excavate. Uh, you now have uh, native born archeologists in all of these Middle Eastern countries and it's all for the better, of course. So um, may the looting stop, may we have uh, uh, scientifically based archeological work and uh, it will all be a better world for it. But thanks for raising the issue. Thanks. Okay, is that okay, Rachel? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I was just thinking, you know, one of the, it's not a solution, but one thing we can do, of course, is be more open about the source of the material. So it's quite clear that it's it's coming from a problematic source. Right. I um, will I, 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 excuse me. I will tell you that the leading center for research in the U.S. is called the American Schools of Oriental Research, and they have. It is for now. I think they're thinking about changing the name. They're changing. They? They're thinking of changing their name, getting rid of the word Oriental. But mm. ASOR has offices in Jerusalem. Uh, Amman, Baghdad, and Cyprus. And um, uh, their policy is they will not publish anything that was illegally excavated, anything that turned out in the antiquities market, even if it can be, even if it can be demonstrated to be authentic. Uh, their policy is not to allow such material to be published in their publications. Uh, so that is one option, right? Uh, uh, to, you know, I, I don't know what everybody else does. In, 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 in the UK, you have the uh, Palestine Exploration Quarterly, published by the Palestine Exploration Fund, and you have the Egypt Exploration Society, and the British School in Iraq. You have all of these um, it's, uh, um, research centers with published journals. Uh, I don't know what other, anybody else's policy is, but that's at least the ASOR policy. Yeah. I, I think it's it's developing more that way with other journals as well. And you know, sometimes there's provisos like you can publish it if the contextual information is, is right. properly promoted yeah. as part of the discussion, or if it's to highlight the problem and things like that. But you know, something we increasingly have to deal with as we become more aware of our own um, responsibilities, I guess. Right. Yeah, but uh, thanks for raising the issue, yeah. yeah. Sure. Thanks, Rachel, that, that was uh, very important. Uh, so now we're getting some more questions. Um, and at the end, shall I just say from Modi in Israel, we have a thank you, absolutely fascinating. And from Martin, uh, are you unmuted, Martin? I think so. You sent it to everyone so they can see it in the chat. Right, uh, I'm sorry. That's okay, easily done. You can ask the question uh, now vocally. Well, I, I, I was just sort of curious um, because I, I've read some things about the Khazars and they're uh, <laughs> Um, also, uh, 
kind of an obscure story that's become more more uh, uh, sort of half known in recent times um, of a uh, of a Jewish uh, ruled kingdom, um, and I'm I'm just curious whether it's known. It sounds like not much was known of Chimyar at all, but um, it to the extent anything is known about their law, whether it was influenced by halakha. So um, just to bring everybody up to speed, the a question starts out with referring to the kingdom of the Khazar. So just to contextualize it, the, there was a Jewish kingdom, yet another Jewish kingdom in um, what is today uh, Southern Russia, um, the Khazars of the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries approximately, uh, who were a well-known political, a Turkic tribe, a well-known political entity in that part of the world, sort of between Persians to the south and Russians to the north, uh, who converted to Judaism, and they were made famous by um, Yehuda HaLevi's book, Hakuzari, which is a fictional version um, and a philosophical tractate but uh, that's the kingdom of the Khazars, about whom we also have ever-increasing information about their uh, history due to some archeological finds and some other material. So this is an old story, and our treasurer, Anthony Raven, can also talk about the early, earlier Jewish kingdom, um, Adi Abane, uh, in what is more or less today Kurdistan, mm -hmm. uh, where the queen, Helena, converted to uh, Judaism and how much of the royal family and so on. So we have these little points on the historical timeline of Jewish kingdoms um, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of Jewish history very broadly. Uh, the question about halakha in Southern Arabia, well, we don't have a lot to go on, right? We have tomb inscriptions, but you did see the cemetery dedication inscription I didn't have a photo of it, but it did refer to the fact that Jews should be, the Gentiles should not be buried in this Jewish cemetery. So we don't have a lot to go on. Um, mm -hmm. They seem to, uh, we, can, we can mention the Mishmarot, the priestly rotations. They knew about them. They, they are familiar with that material. Um, I don't, and you know, we have synagogues. I don't recall if, if we have anything that refers to Shabbat or anything of that sort. Mm. Um, uh, so we're, we don't have a lot of material. Um, and um, we, I would say that if they did have a halakha, well, let's put it to you this way. They obviously had, halakha means something usually very specific. It usually means rabbinic law. So I suspect they did not follow rabbinic law since it's doubtful that rabbinic Right, more, law, I, I shouldn't have, yeah, right. I, I mean, I meant more more broadly Jewish right. uh, yeah. uh, biblical law then. Yeah, they would, have mm -hmm. they would have followed the Jewish traditions mm -hmm. of pan-Jewish life, right? Something like that, okay? Um, as opposed to halakha, which almost typically means rabbinic law. It's the term that the rabbis used. Uh, for their own legal material. So we'll just leave it at that. You know, we don't have a lot of evidence to go on. But then much, much later, I guess, their, their dis, what would be their distant descendants wrote that their famous Igera um, to the ep epistle to Maimonides, where they were asking questions. Right. By the, by the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. the Yemenite Jewish community is heavily influenced, especially by the Jewish community of Iraq. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, in fact, there was a migration of Iraqi Jews. We're almost we're almost sure of this mm -hmm. uh, to Yemen in the uh, early latter part of the first millennium, early part of the second millennium CE. Uh, and so we do know that, and the, that, that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the Yemenite Jews, uh, down to the present day, continue to read the Bible translation in Arabic that was produced by Saadia, mm -hmm. who was the Gaon in Iraq. The leader oh wow! The mm -hmm. They still read it. Most Jews read only the Hebrew and the Aramaic. Uh, right. The Yemenite community reads also the Tafsir, the Arabic translation by some. Wow, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's very interesting. So um, now, um, Callum, uh, are you there, Callum? Callum, uh, can you hear me? Um, I have a question anyway from Callum, assuming that. Um, they are still with us. Were there any references to the priestly Mishmarat in the priestly towns you mentioned in Arabia? I'm not quite sure. So the priestly tribes, let me make that yes, clear, that's right, what I which are mentioned in the Quran. And I think the answer to that is no. 
I should mention that that inscription of the Mishmarot, which I showed you from Yemen, we have a very similar one from Caesarea. Um, mm -hmm. Tessa, you may know, and there's a few others that Naveh published, I think. The one from Caesarea, the one from Yemen, uh, I, I, there may be one, one or two more. They're, they're in Hebrew, typically, these lists of the priestly families. Um, those are the, I, I think there's a third one, but I don't remember where it's from. Rechov or En Gedi, to Rechov. Not Rechov, somewhere around. I mean, the, the, the late Joseph Nave, I think, was the one. One of the northern it. synagogues. It's, I think it's in the Israel Museum, and it comes from one of the northern the Galilean synagogues. Right. I don't remember now exactly which of the which of them. But there's a well-known article by Naveh on, on the on the on the Mishmarot inscriptions, including the one from Yemen, which he published. Thank you. Great. Uh, and now uh, Nick, Brett, are you, are you unmuted? I uh, no, I'm I hope I'm unmuted. <laughs> You're very audible. Do you In want to ask a question? Yes. Um, at the, in the first part of your talk, you, you dated the inscriptions to 105 plus the date on the inscription. Where does that 105 come from? Is it related to Trajan's annexation of Nabatea? Yes, it's the date that the, Ro that the region of Nabatea became incorporated into the Roman Empire. And okay. that's, how, that's how they started marking their, their calendar. I, I apologize, I didn't make that clear at the time, correct. Thanks. Well, that's nice and simple. Uh, David Shamash, who um, says I may ask his question. Do you think that lots of Ashkenazi Jews are descended from Russia, not from the Israelites? That is not entirely uh, related to the subject, unless you can see how it might be. Uh, well, I think the, 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 the catalyst for the question might be the, the prior question about the Khazars. Uh, uh, there, 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 there has been speculation, uh, in, including famously by the late uh, Arthur Kussler, who wrote a book called The Thirteenth Tribe, that much of Ashkenazi Jewry, certainly Eastern European Jewry, are not descended from ancient Israel, but are descended from the Khazars uh, and that kingdom, that, uh, but that population which converted to Judaism. This has been totally disproved. Uh, it was never really accepted by anyone to begin with, or by many people, but it's totally been disproved by DNA. Uh, because if you take the DNA of Russian Jews and Yemenite Jews and Moroccan Jews and Italian Jews, uh, they have much more commonality than they do with the, the populations of their host countries. So um, it's pretty clear that all Jews around the world are descended. Uh, there may be some exceptions, Ethiopian Jews perhaps, but they're, uh, they are all uh, descended from the people of ancient Israel and the, and the diaspora. Thanks. Right, and shall we, ah, uh, we have two more questions. Would that be okay, Anthony? And then we should probably call a halt. Um, uh, Marion, uh, if you're there, you can ask it. Otherwise, for speed, shall I carry on? There are three questions um, rolled into one here. Um, what took Jews into Arabia to settle there? Was it, was it trade? That's one question. Did they have contact with Jews in Ethiopia? That's a whole other story. And uh, finally, we, the uh, Himya Kingdom is featured in the Yemen exhibition at the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem. That's just for our... Oh, well, th on the third point, thank you for that. I haven't been to the Bible Lands Museum for, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so. I, uh, um, but uh, it's good to know. So next time I'm in Jerusalem, which was supposed to be in the summer of 2020, but that passed without travel. So the next time I'm in Jerusalem, I will make sure to, to have a look at that. Well, you uh, can probably find it online. Oh, good. Thank you. Right, right. I, uh, the on, I'll go to the online uh, exhibition. So um, thanks for that information. If you don't know the Bible Lands Museum, a beautiful little museum uh, right across the, the, on, across the street, as it were, or next door to the Israel Museum. It's much more, uh, much larger and more famous neighbor. So um, let's see, the question about what brought the Jews to Arabia trade and so on. So yes, uh, first of all, if our reconstruction is correct, it was to get out of the, you know, was to leave the Roman Empire. So you want to leave 
um, in the wake of the two great revolts, and it was very easy to go off into northern Arabia. I showed you the map. It's not that very far at all to places like Tema. Uh, to southern Arabia, presumably it was trade. Uh, maybe they got involved in the, um, in the myrrh and frankincense trade, um, and it was just an ability to, to move into these settled, to these new regions. Uh, this is part of the wonder of the Jewish diaspora. You know, um, I mean, you could ask these questions about what brought the Jews to Iberia at the Western edge of the Roman Empire in the fourth, third, fourth century. We have evidence of Jews in Cologne in the year 325, right? The Northern reaches of the Roman Empire. Uh, so what brings Jews to these, these places? And when Jews come to, the, to England, uh, you know, they just don't, in the wake of William the Conqueror, uh, he brought the Jews from Normandy to England as well. Um, many of you know this history. I mean, they wind up in places like Lincoln and York in the far north, right? So a rel relative far north of England. Um, and uh, it's just the, the avenues are opened up for trade and commerce. And, and um, um, so, yes, this is what would have brought the Jews into the Arabian Peninsula, the combination of wanting to leave the Romans, leave the Roman Empire and the uh, opportunities presumably for trade commerce. Finally, Ethiopia. Oh, right, Ethiopia. I don't think we have evidence for Jews in Ethiopia until the 17th century. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. We do think that there was contact between the Yemenite Jews and the Ethiopian Jews, but we're talking about a time period much later than the period we're talking about uh, today. And so finally, Stephen, uh, I'm not sure where Stephen is. The question is, is there evidence that the tribes you mentioned in Arabia and Yemen were the ones that were forcibly converted to Islam by Muhammad? So then there's the question of what happens to these Jews, right? So the Jews of Yemen remain, as you know, into the 20th, 21st century. So that Jewish community stayed intact. It was, as I said, it was, um, it was infused by a migration of Iraqi Jews at some point uh, a thousand years or more ago. Uh, but the Jews of Central Arabia and uh, Northwestern Arabia, the Hejaz and uh, the regions in the far Northwest, um, either convert, were converted to Islam or um, per, we, don't, we just don't know. The answer is we don't know. Yes, so they either were converted to Islam or perhaps made their way back to the land of Israel again, which isn't too far away. Uh, I, I'm going to have to plead some ignorance here. I don't know what actually happened to these communities, but I don't know if it's my ignorance or the ignorance of, of, of our historical documentation, which isn't as full as we would always like it. Thanks very much. I think we should definitely um, let you off the hook, Gary. You've answered questions very generously and fully after an already very rich and wonderful <laughs> lecture. I should have thanked you once before some of our friends started disappearing, but there's enough people left to give you a very hearty round of applause. Uh, and, to and th 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 thank you, Tessa and Anthony and, every and Sheila and everybody else with the AIAS. It's wonderful that we can continue to reach out to um, uh, our, our friends around the world, as you said, through the Zoom series. So just great that we're all here together. It is terrific. And thank you, um, splendid audience, and for your excellent questions. I should add to my uh, little plea at the beginning that, of course, we would love it most if you feel you would like uh, to become members if you're not already. You then get, um, you know, uh, the constant flow of information into your email as to what's happening. And that same email for Sheila Ford will get you there too. Also, you could look on our website. So thank you and uh, bye everybody. Have a good evening everyone, bye. Oh.